morning, Dan. Wait, no, it's not morning for you. <laughs> uh, yeah, mid-afternoon here, but good morning, Chris. <laughs> uh, hello, everybody. I'm not good at YouTube. I think I'm supposed to say something like, hey, guys, and make a big face. So there you go. That's our intro. Uh, Dan and I are going to take a couple weeks here and record a bunch of videos about, well, a bunch, probably like two or three or however many it takes us, probably not 12, to explain a bit about how the Glint uh, transform and language server work. So for, I, I should explain what Glint is. That's kind of the point of what we're doing here. Glint is a tool that takes handlebars templates as used in Glimmer.js and Ember.js and turns them into TypeScript so that you can actually type check your uh, whole app in an Ember or Glimmer app rather than just the chunks that happen to be written in normal JavaScript or TypeScript. So you can think of this as being analogous to what TypeScript's built-in support for TSX and JSX does or to the Vitor extension for Vue or the Svelte language tools, which do the same thing for Svelte's language templates. Uh, but this is the one for Ember and Glimmer. And we wanted to get some of this knowledge out of both of, but especially Dan's head, because Dan is the genius madman, both. We'll lean toward madman on that one, I think. <laughs> Who is behind most of the shenanigans that make up Glint. Um, it is a complicated job, but one of our goals here is to get that complicatedness out into the world so that one, other people can have a shot at actually learning how this works and be able to work on it. And two, some of the interesting and smart choices that Dan made and some of the, oh my gosh, we did what now? Choices that we had to make to deal with the very different semantics of Glimmer templates versus JavaScript, because spoilers, they're not the same, are things that can be understood, it be out there. This One of my hopes is that actually, as there's some initial exploration under the HTML X thing coming out of Svelte and whatnot, that maybe we can share more of this knowledge and fold some of these learnings together. I have a dream that will probably never happen, but I think it would be great if all of these tools could share a lot of the underlying primitives um, rather than having to reinvent the wheel. Uh, I remain annoyed that TSX gets special case and the rest of us have to build it from scratch every time. But maybe by doing this and sharing some of this knowledge, we can make that less true and people can at least share some of the mechanics and understanding. Anyway, I'm done. I've, I've talked a whole bunch and here's Dan. Dan's the actual smart one here. So, Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, that was, you hit all the high level points. I'm just here to talk about code for the most part. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, do we want to just dive in on kind of the big picture? Is there is there more setup we should be doing before we? I, th I think maybe if, so what we're going to do today is we're going to start by walking through the architecture of Glint. Uh, but it might also be helpful before we do that to get into a little bit of kind of the background. Where did, so you built this thing over the past four years, I think. Uh, I think it was yeah. pre-pandemic that you started the hacking on it. So it's been a hot minute. Um, kind of maybe the motivation is relatively obvious, but just talk about kind of the process we went through to get here to give people some context and background. Sure. Yeah. Um, I honestly, definitely there is some scratch code from pre-pandemic that was the precursor to a lot of this. I have no idea if any of that actually lives on in the project today or not. This has gone through a few iterations <laughs> Each one's slightly less terrible than the previous one, but all of them, you know, you're gluing together several different systems that want nothing to do with each other. So it's always going to be a little bit of an adventure. But yeah, I mean, I think, like you said, the big picture goal was, hey, TypeScript is cool. We build applications and you can write all of the script part in TypeScript and that works great. But templates are the actual glue that bind together an Ember or Glimmer application. Mm -hmm. And if that's not visible to your type system, then what you're getting is just small islands of well-checked code mm -hmm. that are completely isolated from one another. And you're not actually getting any of that application-wide safety that you want from using a language like TypeScript. So this originated, yeah. I think, in a gist 
where I was just like, I wonder what I can do in the TypeScript playground to like sort of represent what's happening in a template as TypeScript. <laughs> I think and I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of a lot of that initial just was actually focused on things that are no longer such an issue, like how do we deal with the fact that when you see curly curly foo in a template, that could be a property on your backing component, or it could be a helper invocation, or it could be, you know. It could be All a component different. itself, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of that early take was focused on that kind of like ambiguous resolution and things like inferring the types of the args you yield and things like that. And over time, we kind of evolved from there to independently, Ember was moving toward, okay, there are also good runtime reasons not to want to have to do all of this resolution work to figure out what's going on. Um, and we also kind of Turns took out a step back. A faster. Yes, yeah. We also sort of took a step back architecturally and said, okay, we could try and infer the types of the arguments you yield and things, but that gets thorny if they're complicated and you're dealing with generics. And at the end of the day, it's kind of the same as a function. Like, yes, you can infer the return type, but you're generally going to be happier if you annotate it because you're going to find your problems locally instead of them cropping up somewhere else completely in your code base. And so having that thought was what took us from, okay, today, today being four years ago or whatever, <laughs> components take an args right. type parameter. And we sort of developed this idea of, okay, what if it wasn't just args? What if it was a whole signature? What if you were accounting for mm -hmm. the args that come in and the block parameters that go out? What if we were accounting for the type of the element that you splat your attributes and modifiers onto? And that turned into RFC. I don't remember the number anymore, but um, eventually was standardized. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds about right. There. We'll link um, it in the YouTube notes down there. Great. Go down there. Yeah. Yeah. See, we're good at, we're professional YouTubers. It's down there. Like, comment, and subscribe. <laughs> Please. <laughs> so once we had that, the just, and this was all kind of happening in parallel. This is a very revisionist view of history now, but um, <laughs> that allowed us to stop having to do a lot of this kind of like inference work and to start mm -hmm. focusing more on what the actual ergonomics were and trying to make it not just can you make red squiggles show up if something's wrong, but can you make red squiggles show up and be useful? And can you make other useful things <laughs> work like type narrowing when you, like if right. you say if foo, then we know inside that if that that shouldn't be null or undefined, you really want that to work. Right. Um, and so that led us closer to the design we have today, which we will go in much more depth on, but um, that's sort of yeah. the, the 10,000 foot there to here, I think. Are there any yeah. key parts of that story I left out? No, I think that's helpful. And I think that's a good summary. I think you said something that I want to emphasize for people who are listening and is maybe not obvious to everyone. And that is, if you don't have checked templates, then it's kind of like saying everything in a module is typed, but at your module boundaries, you throw away all your types. So every import statement you write becoming an any that doesn't have any type safety on it would dramatically reduce the value of having a language like TypeScript at all. In so much so that while I still found it valuable in the pre-Glint days, because local safety is not nothing and it does actually solve a lot of problems, you are just throwing away all of the glue across your system because in your your normal Ember or Glimmer or Svelte or whatever else app, the majority of the actual bridging between parts of your system happens in the template layer because you're authoring front end code. The whole point at the end of the day is to get some HTML on the screen that has some interactivity attached to it. And we write a lot of JavaScript or TypeScript to do that, to get advanced interactivity and data loading and all the things we do. But at the end of the day, most of your function calls end up looking like JSX or handlebars invocations or something like that, that actually wire up all of that functionality. So that's why this matters so much. It's basically like saying, yeah, 80% of the code in your code base is type checked because 80% of it is typed script. But the last 20% is all the parts that connect all of it. And so you have no idea what's going on there. And that, that ended up being a huge factor at LinkedIn, for example, uh, one of the kind of hard lines we drew was that without the ability to type check in the templates, it just wasn't worth the enormous effort of converting millions and millions and millions of lines of code. Now, obviously the trade-offs look different 
if you have 10,000 lines of code or maybe even 100,000 lines of code like we did when I was at Olo working on this before, you, you can get a higher benefit to cost ratio there because it just takes less effort to convert. But for us, Glint was one of the key pieces that we had to have to make this work. And all of those other things that we did along the way for Ember reasons, a lot of that was a virtuous cycle where early TypeScript adopters like us, Dan and I were some of the <laughs> brave, foolish, you pick both souls who were doing TypeScript before there was good story for it at all. We were feeding in things that helped build the Ember Octane programming paradigm, like let's get native classes because spoilers, you can't make the non-native classes work with TypeScript. Basically, it all like you could do it, but it's going to be a really bad time. Ask us how we know. Uh, and so all of those kinds of things, the the move to a somewhat more statically resolvable world enabled all of this. So enough with the background. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and we're going to jump in and, and kind of talk through the architecture. And we're going to start, we got an idea from one of the folks who worked on the Rust language server tooling, Rust Analyzer, to create an architecture.md document. And this gives us a place so that other people can reference it, but it's also nice for our purposes right now to be able to talk through what is the high-level architecture of this thing, and then to be able to dig into some of the details of what that high-level architecture actually means in practice. So I'm going to share my VS Code window. And here's our architecture MD. Gonna open the preview and we'll just look at the preview instead because you really don't need the markdown source and the pictures they're pretty yay <laughs> so this is your brainchild dan um let's talk through kind of this overview here this graph this little image kind of captures it but can you maybe talk us through a little bit of what each of these pieces are and how they work at at this high level yeah absolutely um, so I talked a little bit already about how this all sort of originated as a thought exercise of like, what would it look like to try and represent a Glimmer template in TypeScript in a way that TypeScript could provide you feedback on. Right. And to this day, that's still sort of what's at the heart of the system. And so that top purple arrow there is a process that takes a given template and transforms it into TypeScript. Um, so there's a package that we'll dive into called Glint template. And there is no content in that package at all other than .dts files that just describe a hypothetical version of how you might write <laughs> templates in TypeScript. Um, you would no never write ever, them like this. <laughs> yeah, no, they look terrible. Um, no one would ever want to hand author code that way. But in terms of trying to trick TypeScript into giving us useful feedback, it turns out that you can get a pretty long way with that. Um, so we walk a template and we turn it into TypeScript. There's lots of nitty gritty details on how that process actually happens that depends on what kind of environment you're operating in, but we can put that to the side for now. Mm -hmm. Once we've done that, we hand that off to the TypeScript API. Um, That's here, yeah. Yes, that looks very different depending on whether you are running in the language server or running in the CLI or running in the CLI in watch mode or running in the CLI in build mode or running in the CLI in build watch mode or TypeScript has a number of great compiler APIs, but they're all slightly different depending on exactly what you're trying to do. Um, so we've gotten to play lots of games with trying to build yeah. one sort of extension to TypeScript that has to plug into a bunch of these slightly different compiler APIs. But in the end, the gist is when TypeScript goes to load a file, if that file looks like a template or looks like it has a template associated, or again, kind of goes through any of these nitty gritty environment specific mm -hmm. things, we take it and pre-process it with this transformation step before then handing it off to TypeScript. And the key thing that that means is that we aren't, other than some very, very limited, like, hey, this is a syntax error. This literally isn't a valid template. We aren't mm -hmm. generating any diagnostics ourselves. We don't, like, Glint doesn't understand in any real semantic sense what it is to invoke a helper or something. We have the DSL that represents for TypeScript what that means, but Glint is really just following this mechanical process of taking, hey, this looks like a helper invocation and turning it into something that TypeScript will interpret as though it were calling a function. So we hand things off to TypeScript. It does its analysis, all of that magic that is well beyond me. 
<laughs> and comes back and says, hey, there should be some squiggles here. And that's fine. We can deal with squiggles. We basically just take them and say, OK, if this squiggle is here in the TypeScript we generated, we mm -hmm. need to kind of walk that back to the original template and say, OK, mm -hmm. that actually corresponds with this identifier or helper invocation or whatever in the template. Right. Um, and then so we need. Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, so as a really quick example for people following along, if your Glimmer component has an argument that's supposed to be a string and you hand it one, two, three instead, TypeScript is going to see this, this representation here, this template DSL, and it's going to give you an error in terms of that. But the line numbers and column numbers and everything else are going to be wrong. So that's the mapping that we have to do so that it shows up in your template invocation in some way. Exactly. And so in this initial transformation process at the top, we're building up a whole tree that maps like, okay, this location corresponds to this, or if it's on this AST node, that's squiggles go over here. And then right. we just do that whole thing back in reverse when we get down to the bottom and then print it out to your terminal or show it in your editor or do whatever is appropriate for the situation we're operating in. Yeah. So that that's a really helpful overview and high level thing. I think one of the pieces that's maybe... And we'll dig into this more as we look at the code. But one of the things that's not obvious here until you've done it is that the template DSL that we'll see is not just the kind of naive as a is as a word is maybe a little loaded, but I'm using it here in a purely descriptive sense. Like your first pass instincts of what this might look like ends up not being the case because spoilers, we tried that and it didn't work very well because we want to get useful diagnostics out of it. And that's that's one of the keys here is we want it to be correct. Of course, you want it to be correct. Uh, and you also want it to be useful. And in some sense, saying that out loud is like, duh, of course you want it to be correct and useful. But what that means when you're actually compiling from one language with one set of semantics to a different language with a different set of semantics, and that's Part of what's happening here, we have this described as a transform, but it's fundamentally actually a compiler that is compiling from Glimmer's semantics to TypeScript's semantics. And those aren't the same because Glimmer is actually a programming language. And we don't think about this often because it's an embedded programming language that needs you to supply definitions for helpers and things like that in JavaScript. But if you think about the fact that we have named arguments to helpers or components or modifiers, that's not a thing that exists in JavaScript. That comes from Ruby because handlebars came out of Ruby and Ruby has named arguments just like Python, but we don't have that. So how do we represent that and named arguments? And a lot of the things we'll dig into in terms of the details are like that there. How do we make it both correct and useful given that it's actually a compiler. And we talk about transforms because that's less intimidating and it's how we think of it. It's a mapping, but it matters that it is actually doing compilation. What was the other thing I was thinking about? Something about... Ah, you mentioned the environments. I think the other thing that's worth calling out is what we mean by environments. And again, we'll dig into the details of this, but Ember has sort of the classic environment where you have a dot... HBS handlebars file, and you have a .js or TS TypeScript or JavaScript file. And those stand alone. And there's some sort of resolution mode under the hood. Ember says, okay, this string in this position from the AST, it, this is a helper, or this is a property on the backing class for this component or something like that. Well, Glint has to do all of that. Glint has to know this .foo is a property on a backing class. What's the backing class? Is it a component? Is it a uh, controller? <laughs> is it an Ember component or a Glimmer component? And therefore, what does that mean? Same thing for arguments, uh, et cetera. That's the loose mode, the, the sort of classic mode for templates. And then we have the new RFC 779 strict mode templates, where you have a template tag that actually is part of the body of the component definition, whether by itself or as part of a backing class. In some ways, that's a lot easier for Glint because we don't have to just be like, ah, we're pretty sure it's that <laughs> file over there. Um, but that's some of the mechanics we have to think about. And also, when I go look up that string, I don't have to be like, hey, where does this 
helper string come from? We can just say, ah, it's that import. Imports, turns out they're nice. Who knew? Uh, we knew. Uh, the TypeScript people knew a long time ago. <laughs> so that's high level summary. Um, and you can see, I we wrote up a bunch of those same descriptions here. So worth reading. Um, maybe let's talk through, not read through this obviously, but kind of the, the big picture about each of these chunks and then look at them. So we have the template DSL. Um, the thing that I think is worth calling out here for people to get their head in or get this into their head are some of the things we we tried to capture. What are the invariants? What are the relationships to the rest of the, the code? Um, this chunk is what Dan just described. Like what's the actual transformation, the comp compilation. But this part is the part that confused me at first. And I think it confuses people in general, which is that when we're doing all this transform, we never actually put it on disk. So you can't do a find references for any of the things that are in that DSL. You'll never see them. They only exist in memory with the exception of debug output that we have a flag to glint that lets you say, please do put it on disk. I would like to understand what you're emitting here, um, which is very useful uh, props to Ed Faulkner for implementing that a year or two ago. The key invariants are the template DSL doesn't know anything about anything. It's just like, here are the types. Here's how they get emitted. It lives in Glint template. It doesn't have any dependencies on the rest of the system. Environments are the part where I was just describing. What, you know, what is a Glimmer component look like in Ember strict mode? For that matter, what does a Glimmer component look like when you're running it in Glimmer JS standalone, not as part of Ember? Uh, and because of that latter concern, we have to handle things like the HVS backticks format versus template tag. We also have to know what things are built in because Glimmer.js and Ember.js have different things that are built in that you don't have to import. I have feelings about this. <laughs> <laughs> they, <laughs> I wish that were not true, but here we are. Um, does it? Do the environment packages depend directly on anything, Dan? They have a peer dependency on the template package. Okay. Yeah. Um, because in fact, we'll get to this, but not core never actually references the template directly. Like Glint mm. core and Glint template don't know anything about each other. They are only glued together via the environment packages. Okay. I had forgotten that. That's helpful. Low coupling people. It's a good idea. <laughs> And and historically, maybe this is worth calling out. That wasn't true. Um, I don't remember when or how it changed. I think, to be clear, Dan did a really good job of keeping the coupling low in general, but really firmly drawing that. And it may have always been the case. You can tell me uh, that Glint never specifically knew about the template and always went through the environments. But like the fact that there's only a peer dependency is a choice that we made when we got close to 1.0, uh, in part so that just whoever's supplying it just says, whoever's using Glint just says, here's my template, my environment, and the core. And I'm responsible to give you the correct versions of all of those and just update them over time. Has it always been true that the core and the template literally never knew any? I think it was template literally never knew anything about anything else, right? But so template basically started as an implementation detail of the environment packages because mm. their job is to actually expose the DSL, but it turns right. out that DSL is mostly the same across environments. It only changes mm -hmm. in some subtle ways. Um, what then happened is as people started adopting Glint, we were like, oh, some of these types in template are actually useful. And then we had situations right. with like environment Ember loose and environment Ember template imports where you wanted multiple environments active at the same time. Right. And the combination of those two things together was what led us to move template to be a peer dependency, because that is something that you only want a single copy of. There are unique symbols and things in there that we need to coordinate on across the whole ecosystem. Um, and so at the end of the day, we said, okay, Clint template has useful utility types. It describes what it means to be a component or a helper or a modifier. Um, and we sort of embraced that as like, okay, Clint template is the source of truth. That is something that users may reference. That is something that like library types might reference. Like, right. hey, I'm going to yield something that is component-ish. Don't worry about whether it's an Ember component or a Glimmer component or something that I wrote with a custom manager. It doesn't right. matter. It's component-like. Um, so that was sort of the example, evolution there. Yeah. As a good example of that, component-like or modifier-like or helper-like are things that come from the at Glint template package 
so that you as an end user can say, or I mean, when I wrote the types for Ember itself for making sure it exposes the right things, I'm going to pull a couple pieces, it, not actually importing from Glint template, but in terms of the exports that Glint template needs uh, to marry things together. And we'll talk about that probably not today, but next time or the time after about how do we make these things fit together as an ecosystem? Because ecosystem coordination, it's hard, uh, but that separation Dan just described helps us with it because we can author in terms of those things in ways that let people experiment in terms of this core DSL without needing to directly depend on it, without needing multiple copies of it that would conflict with each other, et cetera. Then we have core. Dan, tell us about core. I can tell us about core. Uh, so core, I have gone back and forth more times than I can count on whether <laughs> core is a good name for this package or not. Most of the time, I think yes, but really you can conceptualize Glint from either your entry point is Glint template or your entry point is Glint core. And I think depending on which way you are sort of thinking of it, mm. Glint core actually makes perfect sense as a name or is a terrible name. But regardless, <laughs> it's what it's called. Um, Glint core is where if Glint template is the type level runtime, if it's mm -hmm. the thing that powers like how the actual type evaluation and execution works, Glint core is the tooling level runtime. It contains mm. the language yeah. server and the CLI and uh, also has a sort of, but not really, but a little bit public uh, programmatic interface as well that it exposes. Right. Just like TypeScript. Yeah, basically. We could have named they it don't at believe Glint in semantic slash... versioning, so. <laughs> That's right. We could have named it at Glint slash where the magic actually happens. Right. Um, so core core is what understands the actual mechanical process of doing that translation we talked about earlier, as well as integrating that process into the TypeScript language server or the TypeScript CLI or whatever other programmatic usage you might have. Right. So for example, and we've got this documented here, we have a subcomponent that knows how to load the Glint part of your TS config. So when you have the Glint key and you say, hey, I want to use environment Ember loose and environment Ember template imports, and I want to supply these additional tweaks to how to process it. That comes from core. Uh, whoop, come back. Same thing. There's a transform that does the mapping, is what Dan was just saying, that says, okay, I'm going to take, I'm going to run the uh, Glimmer template compiler from at Glimmer slash template compiler, I believe. And builds the template DSL in terms of that config. And so this is where we keep that mapping of, okay, I gotta, gotta be able to map the diagnostic when I get it from TypeScript uh, back into actual Glimmer templates. And this is, Dan called this out, this is purely functional. It It's literally just input output. You give it, give it an input, it compiles it into an output and or vice versa. And it's there's no state here. It's very straightforward to test. Well, that's a lie. It is very mechanical to test. <laughs> Writing the actual output for it. Uh, if you ever look at those tests, you're going to be like capital gamma dot what now? But it is very useful to. Uh, it's very mechanical and it's very straightforward. Is close to the right word. Um, the tests are all snapshots. It's fine. As long as they don't change, yeah. you didn't break anything. <laughs> and if it does change, then that's its own adventure. Right. So then we plug that into the VS Code plugin. And we've got another picture. Uh, the VS Code plugin and related core here. We didn't call this out explicitly, but core has the CLI in it. Um, and so at Glint core supplies the Glint executable. And th that act very, very similarly to the VS Code plugin. They just necessarily, you know, their outputs are different is the way to think about it. One of them runs a CLI, invokes TSC directly, and hands you back the results on the CLI. The VS Code plugin, by contrast, has an integration with the language server. And our language server is a very, very thin language server. It basically just says, here's the input files. I'm going to do the same mapping that the core CLI does, um, because again, that's just part of the core. 
and I'm going to hand off to TypeScript. And then TypeScript is going to give me things back and I'm going to map back. Uh, so the mechanics of that are very different because language server is stateful. It has the ongoing, like I need to be aware of all the workspaces here. I need to keep references to them. I need to know what to look up when and where and how, because those might be configured differently. So does the CLI, but it has to do it in a one-shot way rather than the entire lifetime of your working in the project in VS Code. Um, there, are, The other thing that's maybe worth calling out here is there's a language server package um, you don't have to consume via VS Code. So NeoVim works just fine. I was messing around with seeing if I could wire this up in Nova, my favorite editor. It's totally doable. Uh, I haven't gotten there yet, but it's very doable. It's not, not super hard because each of these pieces has appropriate shear layers in it. So we visualize what this looks like here. Everything up through this point is the same across everything we've talked about, whether it's the CLI or any other language server consumer, and then whatever editor plugins you're using, whether again, that's NeoVim or Nova or VS Code or IntelliJ, it all can just flow through this core. And this little bridge here is meant to capture the fact that when the core does the work of running this transform we just described, it does it in terms of the Glint environments that you're running in. So if you're using Ember environment loose, it needs to be, that information needs to be plugged in to tell Glint how to do the transform. Go look up the backing controller or backing component class because it's not in scope. We just have a, you know, a template file that we need to map into something. And then likewise, when we emit, how does it play into the actual emit, Dan? Because I, I remember how it plays in in what I just said for the transform, but when we're going from the transform into the template DSL, what are some of those differences? So the transform will reference the DSL via the environment package. And so that's mm. what I was getting at earlier about how the, the template DSL yeah. originated as an implementation detail of the environments. Mm -hmm. And so what gets spit out from the transform imports the DSL from whatever the active environment package is for that template. Right. Most of that is going to be directly re-exporting the standard DSL. Mm -hmm. But um, things like, can you use native functions as helpers or not, is something that like, it's, you can sort of re represent that with the same system we use for everything else with helpers, but like it starts to fall over if you have parametricity and things like that. Functions are just different. Everything else that we deal with yeah. in the whole manager system is, oh, it's an object and it, you can do stuff with it. Functions are their own kind of special thing. And so originally the GlimmerX environment, I think was the only one that did this. Mm -hmm. It basically said, okay, if you're resolving something and it's a function that gets handled differently. Um, so anytime there are subtle tweaks like that, those right. get represented in terms of how the DSL is tweaked when it's re-exported. Right. Largely, I think that can go away these days. There is still some stuff around like, what do we do? Like the component helper. I think we have some, right. the DSL itself has to sort of customize a little bit because that thing is monstrously Special. complex to try and type. <laughs> And in like Ember Loose, you just have to know like this thing looks like a helper, but it receives a very, very magical string as its first argument. And so the DSL right. kind of accounts for some of that. Right. Cool. So I think we've covered at a high level the architectural. That's the bottom of the doc, except there are footnotes. Uh, and again, I do recommend anybody who's wanting to get their heads around this actually go dig through the architecture MD does go into more details and more specifics than we have covered here. But I think another thing to see then is how that breaks down code structure wise. So you can see, for example, that we have these packages and these correspond to exactly what you would expect based on what we've just described. And then we also have, and this is important, there are a bunch of test packages. And these test packages are the things that we use to make sure that this works in all the different contexts. So a JavaScript only Glimmer X app, that's an environment we care about. We want Glint to work in JS environments, just like TypeScript does. So that if you write some JS doc, you get autocomplete. And if you type a slash slash at TS check at the top of your file, you can actually get type checking there. And there are apps at LinkedIn and elsewhere that use that. So we test that and we test a TS Glimmer X app. 
as well. And you can see that, you know, what this ends up looking like is some just piece of code that actually does all the things that we need it to do. It has a template definition in it. It has signature types in it. And you can, it those, those have generics in them. We want to make sure that generic class components work and do the things they should and that the types you get out the other side work. We have these for every one of these kinds of environments that we care about so that we can make sure that when we make a change to the core DSL, for example, uh, or to the transform, that it works correctly. And even if you're in an Ember component, doing Ember component-y things, please don't, please just migrate to Glimmer components, please, for the love of all that's good in the world. Um, but we make it work, right? We wanna make sure that you say, okay, I've got a div element here. If we break this, does it work? If I say this is supposed to be an HTML audio element, I come over here, whoopsie, you can't spread onto that anymore. And so one of the other nice things is as long as you have built Glint locally, uh, then your VS code will correctly be able to pick it up and see that, oh, I can actually see what's broken in my tests when doing this. And if I fix that, change it back, everything's back to working correctly. So we have these test packages. We also have then the packages we just described. We have the template package, which is worth seeing how this actually works a bit. Um, package.json will point you to the entry point is in this private package. And here you can see that we actually have the DSL defined. So we implement our integration and our signature stuff. Making a signature work is, well, it's interesting. Um, we have some serious type level magic going on here. It's not really magic. It's just, we have to do a lot at compile time to make all of these things work, and in particular, work backwards compatibly. Dan mentioned earlier, and I'll probably make a standalone video in the next couple of weeks that covers this, that we moved from having Glimmer components just be type parameterized over their args. So you would say class greet extends component, and it would just take args that was just an args object. So it would be like, you know, args with, I should be writing code here. Um, TypeScript, you would have written something like class greeting extends component, and this would just say name string and get greeting would have done something like return hello, this dot name, and that would have, or this dot args dot name, I should say, and that would have type checked. And I'm not importing anything, so that's why we have red squiggles everywhere. But we moved that to being in this world where this needs to be args name of string to get the right type, but we needed to be backwards compatible. We couldn't just break everybody. And so a lot of the shenanigans you'll see in our signature handling is, does that work? Um, but we also have to handle notice positional args because we also have to handle Ember classic components, which can take positional arguments. So a lot of the complexity here is for backward compatibility, and maybe that can go away someday. You can imagine a world where you don't have all of this complexity because components don't take positional args anymore because we've deprecated that and moved on. But for today and the foreseeable future, that's the kind of stuff going on. Now in the future, in an, another episode of our deep dives on Glint, I think we'll actually talk through a lot of these kinds of pieces of code, like what in the world is happening when we pre-bind args? Well, see previous discussion about component helper. You've got to be able to do type. partial application. I hate that type so much. <laughs> As well, you should. Yeah. It's really hard. Um, but those are the kinds of things that are in here is like, let's do the work to make it so that the component helper can partially apply the arguments to that component, and then you can yield it and someone can invoke it with no args or override those arguments. That's why it gets really hard. Um, and then we also have to represent things like, what kind of thing can you actually render into a template, et cetera? We also have definitions for what's an integration. How do you actually define things that are going to use all of this? keywords that are built in. Uh, we just saw signature. And then the interesting bits, the really, really interesting bits are here in the resolve and emit and so on packages. 
And this is where you will see things that really make your head explode um, <laughs> along with in the transform, because you end up seeing things like this, where we, we Ooh, basically turn things into function update. calls. <laughs> it's not Probably what that looks comments. like anymore. Uh, what does it look like now? Um, uh, much less like the template than that does. <laughs> and that's true. You talked earlier yeah. about how like we've revised this over time. And each time that's happened, the resulting TypeScript has looked less like the template language, less like something yeah. a human would write, but right. more like something TypeScript can understand what it means. Mm -hmm. And therefore that we can produce useful diagnostics from. Mm -hmm. um, and and it's worth seeing that the, the transform is in core. And so mm -hmm. we can and close all these windows and see. So core has, it has the CLI, so we can do a build or a watch or a check. It has the language server, which allows you to go ahead and import it. There's over here is the VS code server. So you can see that the VS code package ultimately just imports from this trans or not the transform, but the language server package, which defines all the mechanics we need to have a, a language server. There's the glint config package, just like we talked about. There's a bunch of common utilities that are used in both the language server and the CLI. So we have them in a common package. And then we get into the transform. And diagnostics here allow us to add information to the or rewrite the message for diagnostics. Because sometimes we know that ah, this particular string means that TypeScript saw an error that actually means this. And otherwise, you're in just like, what in the world? <laughs> Um, expected n arguments, but got m. Like, okay, that named args are complicated. See previous discussion where JavaScript and TypeScript don't have them. So we have to do special things to make those uh, messages make sense when we actually report them. Um, and we can also do the work of rewriting them using those and do the, the template mapping for them. Then the template itself, this is the, the really fun sauce. Um, we have to keep track of our scope to see what's in in scope. We have I like to that. know how- I like that file. It's short and easy to read. It's yeah, much, much it's nicer nice. than most of the rest of this. <laughs> like this one, which is long and not that hard to read, but not trivial either. Just and maybe yeah. Go if we're gonna compare length, just uh, don't open template to TypeScript. I think that's the big one. I mean, that's not too bad. It's only 1,360 lines long. Uh, but this gives you, this is actually a good good thing to kind of show, hey, when we see an identifier string, what is it doing? When we see a hash key, what is it doing? When we see a property access, what is it doing? And when I said earlier that it's a compiler, I meant it. What we're actually doing is we've got a transform that emits the appropriate text here. And so, for example, here we're saying, do, do we have something that should be represented as an optional property access using question dot? If so, okay, do that and push the offset into the thing so that we can keep track of scope so that we can map it back through. You don't need to follow the details today. The point is that's the kind of stuff we have to do here. And then the result of that ends up being when we look at the, where are the tests for this one, Dan? Uh, up a directory yeah. there, test there test, transform. transform. And template to TypeScript. So you can see here, we have these inline snapshots and you end up with things where you're saying, okay, if I have, If you yes. skip a little further down, this is specifically testing the boilerplate. Once ah, you get yeah, past yeah. this block, then they're a little prettier. You're at least not dealing with the outer boilerplate because that's ugly to look at in the tests. Right. So here's here's a recognizably template looking thing. And we can see that we're testing like, oh hey, it, you know, we should be able to have directives that map over it, et cetera. But what does it turn into? Okay. Well, here's a template body that we're going to transform from this. In this case, we're going to skip type checking, so there won't be any errors on it. But it's going to have an angle bracket invocation and two different kinds of curly bracket invocations, one that should be 
kind of resolver mode, um, one that would be a helper, et cetera. But we can see that what it turns into is this. And this doesn't look, as Dan just said, anything like what a human would write. It, you couldn't write this by hand if you wanted to, to be perfectly honest and get it right. But it gives us the ability to give you good errors when everything comes back because we can say, okay, I've correctly resolved this or gotten a return value from it, depending on what the operation should be. I have some context. I have some global context. I don't know about you, but I'm not that fluent in typing Greek characters on my keyboard anymore. My biblical Greek is a few years behind me and my classical Greek <laughs> even farther back. Um, but that's the kind of thing that we have to emit. And that's the stuff that is always in memory that you never actually, you know, you're never going to see unless you invoke that debug. You're never going to see resolver return or emit content or any of those things. But this is the template DSL. And this is the part that TypeScript actually type checks. It's going to see here's a context which has some args on it maybe named foo. And I'm going to do emitting content that has resolved or returned this okay, et cetera, from this. That's what we actually have to do to get useful, helpful error messages on template content because of that language mismatch I was describing earlier. Comments on any of this here, Dan? Uh, no, there are billion more things to say about that, but I will yeah. hold for deep dive on the template Thanks. DSL. So yeah. So that's a high level overview of Glint and how it works. Uh, I think that's probably enough. We've got almost an hour or an hour of content here. The big takeaway, I think, is to see that we've got a well decoupled set of packages that represent the different phases here. And those things hopefully allow you to understand if you're looking at where might a bug be coming from in Glint or where might we need to wire things up in Glint? Now, hopefully that gives you an idea. So for example, if we want to wire up more language server features, really the only place you should have to do almost any of that is in the language server package. Almost anything we want is already present otherwise. You should never have to touch the template DSL to make a language server feature work. You should never have to touch the, um, the transform layer probably. Um, but if you did, it would only be in a very limited way. And once you do that, you know, you can get those language server features. You also shouldn't have to touch the CLI to get that to work unless you're making a change to something that's part of the common functionality between the two. Thanks, Dan. The ornery engineer in me is just thinking of all of the reasons you might have to go change those things, but <laughs> realistically, you were exactly right. And the only reason you would have to do that is if like there's some metadata that we should be gathering as part of the transform mm -hmm. that we're not. It really, adding things to the language server or what I think of as adding them to the editor plugin is really just adding them to yeah. the language server. And there's right. one place there where you, you, know, you set the flag that says, hey, this language supports this feature. You go implement that one hook and then everything else just kind of falls into place. And it's right. mostly pretty nice. Right. Um, and that means that that's actually, in terms of where Glint is at, maybe this is a good place to end. Glint is stable. It's been stable. We did the stable release in February, I want to say, somewhere there around March, yeah, sometime this right. spring. And we don't expect a lot of those internal details to change in the foreseeable future. Uh, the kinds of things that might require us to revisit the internals of the transformer if, if the language server or not the language server the language gets new features so if glimmer components get new features that are at a sort of syntactical and semantical level semantical semantical uh where we would need to add support for that um or potentially if we were to add a, an htmlx based syntax where we were collaborating with the Svelte folks and others who are interested to say, here's a Svelte-like syntax that can embed JS expressions. Well, we would need to do some wiring for that. It might have a different environment to go with it. The underlying semantics, because at the end of the day, we're representing Glimmer components in it, would likely be relatively unchanged in that world, but we would need a new transform layer that goes through a new, or a new path in the transform that goes through a new environment that knows how to compile 
a new template syntax for that. And honestly, that would solve a lot of our problems because things like uh, truthiness would just come for free if you were using JavaScript truthiness instead of handlebars truthiness, which, oh boy, handlebars <laughs> truthiness. Um, mm -hmm. But those are the kinds of things that we would expect to see. Um, many of them would be relatively straightforward things where it's just like, oh, we need to upgrade the Glimmer template compiler version and make sure that there's a reasonable semantic interpretation of this. A uh, good example there would be if we came up with syntax that allowed you to destructure things when you yield them in a block. We'd need to do a little work there. It wouldn't be a lot of work, but it would be a little work. Um, things like that are the only kinds of places where we would likely need to make changes in those lower level layers. What that means, though, is that that's the part that's really, really stable and we don't expect any changes. The language server, that, that could get more features. It, please help us implement more features. Uh, there's a bunch of those flags where it just needs somebody to do the work to wire it up. As Dan just said, it's mostly set the flag that says this language server supplies this part of the language server protocol, implement the method that goes and calls the appropriate TypeScript language server, and ta-da, you're done. Uh, write some Generally tests. speaking, <laughs> the hardest part of doing that is looking at the TS compiler API and figuring <laughs> out language server protocol was largely designed by the same group of people who designed TS server and how it works, but they call things, they, they were like, oh, we're starting from scratch. Let's pick a whole new set of names. So literally the hardest part of doing that for a lot of language server features is just figuring out, okay, what is this called right. in the language server protocol and what does TypeScript call it? And like, how do I need to massage the data between those two? Yeah. It tends to be... I mean, because at the end of the day, TS server supports VS code and provides all of these features. Right. So the information is there. The analysis is already implemented. We don't we don't need to, and we don't, as I said at the start of this, we don't add any layer of analysis on top of what's already there. We really, yeah. sort of the foundational architectural goal of Glint is not to do semantic analysis. It's just to make yes. that TypeScript's problem. And yes. what that means is it's easy to go implement new language server features as long as you can figure out how to ask TypeScript the question. <laughs> And I think that's a really good summary of the whole project. Sometimes people ask us, why doesn't Glint do X or Y or Z? Why, like, we know these things about handlebars templates. Why don't we solve that? And the answer is because trying to maintain that becomes very difficult over time. Whereas having what we said earlier, a purely functional transformation where we just take in Glint inputs or Glimmer inputs map them into TypeScript, which is hard, but is, you know, a constrained problem space. Let TypeScript do all the heavy lifting after that, and then map back the results through, again, a purely functional transform. That keeps the domain we're working in much more manageable than if we start trying to pile on additional capabilities on top of it. And I think that does raise interesting longer term questions about how Glint and a hypothetical parent Ember language server would relate. I think that's actually fine. You could imagine a world where there's an Ember language server which embeds Glint as part of it and then also adds on other semantic knowledge. But my hope is actually that we don't need that because as we move more and more into a world where the Ember semantics are themselves much more just JavaScript semantics with this embedded template language. You actually don't need any of that. And this has been one of the reasons for the push toward template tag is you can make ESLint just work with an embedded template tag by using the preprocessor. You can make template lint work in a file without needing to wire it up to a language server by just handing it to a transform that pre-processes and pulls out only that chunk and so on. And so the need for any of those extra pieces diminishes substantially over time. And so my hope, we'll see whether we get there or how in the Ember community, but my hope is, and I think our sort of meta goal has been that by tackling both the Ember pieces of that and then building Glint with this very functional mechanical model we can get to a world where there's just each of these little pieces that don't have to have a host language server that's trying to provide these things. And we're really happy that ELS has existed, that uh, LifeArt did the work to make it jump through the hoops it had to jump through. 
and and hopefully we won't have to do all of those hoop jumping going forward. So good work, Dan. Thanks for making Glint. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for taking the time. Yeah, and we'll be back sometime soon with more exciting content. Don't forget to like and subscribe. You're supposed to mash a button somehow, <laughs> I think. That's what I hear. Yeah, I think yeah. so. With your keyboard or your mouse or something. Mash, mash, mash. That's the... <laughs> And we'll leave you on that note. Thanks, everybody.